structural steels and rail. And um, hopefully I can wrap this up today um, in about an hour. And then on, on Tuesday I will, I will talk about uh, plate products and in particular um, line pipe. And um, so uh, line pipe being very important nowadays, uh, steel industry, it might be of interest to you to um, you know, definitely attend, try to attend the class um, even though um, there, you know, there will be no um, quiz uh, related to the material on Tuesday. Okay. So what are uh, these um, so-called long products? Hmm? So basically we're talking about structural beams and rails. Hmm? Um, what we'll see today is talk about mill designs for beams and rails. And you'll see uh, very, again, very characteristic for the type of product that is uh, being made. Here, uh, in contrast to what happens to bar and wire products, the producer of rail and uh, uh, structural uh, beams makes the end product hmm? that is ready for use um, um, in um, in application for as, 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 uh, in a, uh, as a railroad track. Hmm? And so we'll talk about uh, shape rolling. That's an important uh, part of the um, uh, process here of producing structural beams and rails. And um, so we'll, and, and then we'll underline the fact that for structurals, strength is important. It's the main thing. Uh, in the case of rails, there is an additional uh, requirement, actually a more important requirement than just strength, and that is hardness. Okay. So what, what, how do the products look like uh, that we are um, talking about? Well. Uh, you're all familiar with I-beams, you know, they're widely used and, uh, and seen on construction sites. Pile sheets, yes, if you want to make um, some kind of wall, dirt walls, support dirt walls, um, make um, harbor fronts, etc. And these pile sheets have this very uh, in important detail here, mm -hmm. this uh, curved a part that allows them, that allows you to lock them uh, together. Hmm? Channels and angles, and, and these three things are very common uh, things you see, you'll see in, on construction sites. Hmm? Right. So these um, beams, channels, uh, pile sheets, and angles um, start their production in. Continuous annealing, uh, continuous, excuse me, continuous casting uh, lines where you produce <coughs> blooms, yes. And uh, nowadays, um, you also produce beam blanks, and you can see the advantage of producing a beam blank. You already have part of the general shape of the product in the casting, yeah. Um, and, and so uh, how, how is being done? Well, simply you, the, the uh, continuous casting mold has the shape of this, uh, what's called a dog bone shape. And, and you know, what comes out is, is basically uh, already pre-shaped um, bloom. Yeah? Good. So, um, uh, right, so, so you, you basically could also use slabs most of the time. Uh, you use billets or blooms or these uh, beam blanks. Yeah? And um, they're rolled in special mills, yeah? especially uh, mills, specially designed mills. Um, and of course, and you have to have specially designed roll passes. We'll talk about this in a moment. So let's have a look at um, some uh, general uh, uh, things about what kind of steel grades do we use for these long products. 
Well, basically, they're not very complicated products in terms of uh, the metallurgy. Mm? So if you look at uh, here, these are uh, each beams and channels, angles, and these are typical grades that you would be using. Mm? So let's have a look at uh, the European uh, versions of the, the standards because th they will they give you information about what typical strengths we're talking about. And those are yield strengths, 235, 335. Those are not extremely high strength steels, yes? Although, as we'll, and we'll close with that today, uh, there is definitely a trend to increase strengths also in structural uh, steels for, for long product. Hmm? Rails, for rails we have different uh, standards, right? So the, the whole uh, railroad, um, uh, rail industry has its own standards for steels, yes? And so um, you have, um, for instance, of course in, um, for instance, European Union you have the um, European normalization, yes? Uh, just the same as, as uh, you have for structural steels. In, in the U.S., uh, referred to as ARIMA, which stands for American Railway Engineering and Maintenance of Way Association, yes? Uh, again, this professional engineering organization that's uh, dealing with um, railroad uh, infrastructure equipment. Hmm? And so let's have a look at these uh, rail steel Properties. Um, important um, specifications. Um, uh, railroads are depend are geographically very different. Huh? Um, you have very dense railroad networks in Europe uh, that are used for transport, but also for uh, a freight. Yeah. So um, and so you have. Um, in North America, uh, railroads are used mainly for freight. Yeah? So you have very, uh, very heavy loads on the, uh, on the rails. And because you have very heavy, um, so you're basically hauling a lot of um, stuff over the railroads. And the uh, passenger type of uh, railroads are much, much uh, less uh, important in um, in, in North America. So, um, and, and because of historic reasons, uh, you know, these European uh, standardizations are, are uh, important. There is one that's uh, famous, it's the U, uh, UIC, hmm? which stands for Union Internationale des Chemins de Fer. That's a um, uh, international body that has uh, standards for uh, uh, rails. And and there is a European uh, normalization uh, standard also. So what do we see here? Yes, in, uh, if, you, if we use that, look at these, um, this European uh, standard, the grade name, yes, uh, is, is, is standard as in Euro uh, Europe. So it starts with a letter that is referring to the application. So if, if it starts with an R, it refers to rail, yes. Um, and uh, very often the number that follows this uh, denomination, this um, grade name, is a number. Usually in these European uh, standards it refers to yield strengths or strength, yeah? strength properties. In this case it doesn't. It refers to hardness. It refers to hardness and the Brunel hardness on the Brunel hardness scale. Yeah? All right. And, um, uh, and, and the reason is because our, um, our rails are very heavily um, uh, uh, subjected to wear. Yes, wear when, um, and fatigue, but wear and fatigue at the same time, yeah? Okay, so what do we um, uh, see as, a, as strength levels, yes? Again, not, nothing very excessive, yeah? Um, and it depends also on what type of rail. Okay, well, we'll see that in a moment. You know, there are different rails, um, it, it depending on what, what it's used for. Uh, 
obviously, um, so, so we have rails that are not heat treated. They're basically perlytic uh, uh, steels. And there we have tensile strengths. Remember, a fully perlytic steel, you, reach about, you can reach about 1,000 megapascal, um, unless you're, you're dealing with wire steel where you can get these very high uh, uh, strengths. But in this case, of course, you don't have wires. You have these uh, massive uh, sections. So this is about what you can get. Um, right? And, and so, um, but we have um, rails that uh, we can uh, harden in some way, partially, particularly what we call head hardened uh, rail, yes, where the strength levels uh, are higher than a, uh, a gigapascal. Typical uh, carbon contents here around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 manganese, silicon, and then in the case of uh, hardenable uh, uh, rails, you will have chromium additions. Hmm? Right. Okay, so let's have uh, a review of why is rail hardness so important? Hmm? Because you get a special type of wear, which is uh, rolling contact fatigue. Yes, and it's a, it's a very uh, it's highly dynamical uh, situation. Yes, you get ex extremely high loads. Yes, and um, uh, and you can see here that uh, you you initiate cracks. Yes, uh, in in this type of um, fatigue below the surface. Yes, and you know the part of the metal will crack off. Yeah. Um, there is also an issue with hydrogen uh, content, which should be very low to avoid hydrogen flaking. Yeah? So in, gen and in order to get these extremely low hydrogen contents, uh, modern rails are usually, uh, steels are usually vacuum degassed and also extremely low sulfur contents yeah? because of this requiring requirement for uh, rolling fatigue um, resistance. Good, so um, how do we uh, uh, make uh, rails? Uh, the process uh, usually starts with, nowadays, with uh, beam blanks, yeah, such as those ones shown here. Yeah. They go into a furnace hmm, where they're heated to 1100 to 1200 degrees C. And you're basically ready to um, um, uh, roll uh, the um, rails. So you start up with a, a breakdown mill where you do the rough, um, the large amount of uh, relatively rough deformation, and then finishing mills. Uh, the finishing mills, we'll um, see them in more detail in a moment. Yeah? You get the final shape, yes. There is a um, cooling line here very long cooling line if the rails are long. Nowadays, you have uh, production sites that can produce uh, rails that are about 120 meters in length, yes. They go on a cooling bed, yes. And then you're going to, to uh, through the finishing uh, part. One important uh, aspect of the finishing is to make sure that your rail is straight, yeah. So you have straighteners are important, and then um, finishing involves, for instance, uh, um, the, uh, the ends, taking care of the ends. Hmm? Right, so let's see here uh, in more detail what we have as in a modern uh, rail making um, line, reheating furnace. Uh, breakdown mill. So here you have a uh, reverse uh, rolling here. So the, the um, material goes back and forth for a few times. Then you uh, transfer it to a continuous universal mill. Hmm? Okay. Uh, and in a continuous universal mill, the rail goes in one direction. Yes. And so you've got these um, special 
uh, mills that will do the shaping of the rail. And then you have a hot saw before the, the cooling. Yeah, why, what's the hot saw so important for? Hmm? Um, so you don't shear the, the ends of a rail hmm, to have uh, the right length and the, the quality of the, the cut. You need to do hot cutting, hmm? hot sawing. Hmm? Um, when you see on the cooling bed, the, these very long rails on the cooling bed, hmm, uh, they're not straight. Actually, they're extremely crooked. Hmm? And the reason is uh, because of the section of the rail, yes, they don't cool at the same rate. Yes? And you know that when you go to the phase transformation, yes, there is a lot of uh, expansion hmm? from austenite to ferrite. So as a consequence, on very long uh, uh, pieces like rails, uh, this gives rise to considerable distortion. Yes? Sometimes um, uh, this distortion is partially uh, compensated by pre-bending the, um, the rails in the other direction. Hmm? So if they, if they tend to uh, go this way, uh, uh, thermally from thermal distortion, they're bent in this direction before you start the cooling. Um, okay. So what is a universal uh, rolling mill? Hmm? So a, in a conventional rolling, hmm? Uh, of a um, of long products um, to make uh, to keep things simple, um, you basically go through uh, to two high mills. You just roll this way, um, yes, and um, and you have also grooved rolls. Yes, grooved rolls. As a consequence, uh, there, the surface quality is not so good because the outer flanges hmm, are wiped by the sides of the grooves and become rough. Hmm. So the way you, you make this shape is by having grooved rolls. Okay, and you, so you get friction on this side. Yeah. Okay, because uh, why do you get friction? Because the the the, the um, um, rail moves this direction only, yeah, but the roll goes like this, right? So it you damage the outer surface. Yeah. Nowadays, um, you use universal rolling, yes? And in a universal roll, a rolling mill, you, have, you use what's called a universal mill, yes? And in this case, you have um, rolls in this direction and rolls in this direction. So you have roll in this direction. Hmm? and rolls that turn in this direction. Yeah. Yes. And we call it universal because we can change now this gap and this gap, yes? And make a, uh, uh, in principle, a lot of shapes, yes, with one mill. Right? In this case, because the rolls are grooved, yes, um, one shape for one type of rolls. Yes, you cannot change it. Okay, so um, it also and also because uh, this roll turns, right? It can it rolls with the surfaces, so you don't get uh, surface damage. Yeah? Uh, also, higher productivity, smoother product surfaces, uh, improved roll life. Of course, uh, less wear. Um, and you, this is good. You can you can uh, much better control over the thickness 
uh, the dimensions of your product. Hmm? So you have a horizontal roll, for instance, and vertical rolls here, yes? And you can control the web thickness and the flange thickness at the same time, yes? And in this case, for instance, it's for a channel, illustrated for a channel. Uh, uh, for uh, rails, it's a little bit more complicated, but you also do uh, use universal rolling nowadays, yes, to uh, to make rails. Hmm? Whereas, so um, say you, your starting bloom, say if you if you would work with uh, uh, not a beam blank but a, a, a square uh, bloom, right? Uh, you basically would have to make a rail out of this, you know, this block. Yeah? And traditionally, it's done with these horizontal uh, rolls. Yes? So the deformation, yeah? so you, you, you first start by, um, uh, by doing the rough, the rough deformation in this direction, yes? Yes? and then you use these um, uh, shaped rolls to make the rail. Yeah? That's all the deformation is in this, in this direction. Yeah? In universal mail, it's different. You, it's more, much more homogeneous. Yes? And, and the, the, the mail you're doing it on is, is more flexible. Yeah? All right. right. So this is one, um, one of these um, um, older style um, mills, yes? where, uh, so you can see here, uh, so from the breakdown mill, oops, let's go back, and uh, you can see here, you have uh, two high horizontal uh, uh, rolls, here you have again two high horizontal rolls, here again, yes, and there are only a few intermediate steps where you do also vertical rolling to take care of the head and the foot of the rail. And, and so in a traditional um, uh, rail finishing mill, your, uh, your rail goes through these, you can see here very nicely, a, one of these uh, grooved rolls yes, to make the shape of the rail. And the, the, the rail moves back, because it moves in this direction, and then moves in this direction, and then goes brought here in this direction, yes, on, uh, in this manner in an in a old-fashioned, uh, say, um, rail finishing mill. In the, in the modern ones, the rail goes straight through the whole, um, through a, um, uh, a tandem mill of, um, which has universal stance. Okay, um, the structure of uh, rail steel, Perlite, okay? Uh, we saw last time that uh, uh, perlite is um, also uh, very important for uh, wire products, many wire products. Well, in the case of, uh, of uh, rails, that's basically, uh, you can assume that most of the rails you see um, are are perlitic, it's just this, this is the structure we would see. And so as a consequence, we also get uh, the issue of, you know, if we want high strength, if we want high um, uh, wear resistance, yes, perlite offers a lot of wear resistance, uh, then we have to refine the microstructure. So, that's, that's, so again, it's going to be um, uh, important that uh, the cooling rate is controlled so that we get the transformation within, remember, six, um, 600 to 550 degrees C and you get the fine microstructure. So if you cool down uh, a big rail like this, yes, um, as you, uh, uh, whenever you would stop the cooling at the exterior of the, of the rail, it, it, it's reheated by the core that cools, that cools less. Yes? And there is also an increase in temperature uh, when you do the transformation, which is due to the, the heat of transformation. Okay? This is a typical a CCT diagram for a carbon manganese uh, rail steel. Hmm? Okay. If um, 
so what is interesting, so this would be the cooling rate that you'd want for a, to achieve a fully prolytic microstructure, so not necessarily a very high cooling rate, but uh, if you would be able to cool uh, the rails faster, um, you could actually make bainite, a bainitic microstructure. And uh, particular in, in, in certain um, countries, in particular in, in Europe, there is a trend or an, uh, a lot of interest in using um, rail steel with a bainitic microstructure. And we'll see in a moment uh, what this, the advantages are. The, um, you, you, you can see from the, this is the head of a rail, yes? The head of a rail, yeah? Obviously, it's on the top here, on the top surface, that you want to, the best wear resistance. And, um, but that's also the, a massive piece, yeah? A massive piece. So, uh, what you do um, is you head harden the rails, yes? You, uh, you make sure that the rails are given uh, accelerated cooling, yes? Um, when, uh, uh, when they come out of the, uh, the universal mill. Hmm? So this, here you can see such a cooling head. It's spraying the, uh, the, here the, the head of the rail, yes? So that you get a, a much uh, uh, increased hardness. Hmm? because the, the structure is refined. Hmm? And so you, here you can see the, the hardness profile, yes? and, and you can achieve very high hardnesses on the outer side of this uh, perlytic steel. Um, in, in, uh, so there's, there's been um, uh, uh, certainly a, a lot of interest in uh, rail the last uh, years, yes? because of high speed, uh, high speed uh, tracks uh, are becoming uh, very important. Uh, so in Europe, um, already for many years, in Asia, in China, lots of uh, high speed rails are being um, produced. You have to realize that uh, once a uh, rail track has been uh, uh, put down, it's not forever, right? The, uh, the rails will be monitored. They should be monitored, yes, carefully uh, to see if there's no damage. And then they should be regularly replaced, hmm? okay? So, um, so quality issues are very important, you know, surface quality, surface hardness. And so, uh, and in particular, uh, because you have these very uh, long uh, railroad uh, lines now, hmm? um, we also need uh, very long rails, yes, to, uh, to reduce the cost of uh, building the railroads, yes. So, uh, so, very, the, the, so the, the, the head quality, head surface quality is very important in this case, yes. Hmm? Uh, because of the long uh, distance passenger uh, transport and also freight applications you know, where, where we have very high axle loads, yes? And so these axle loads are tremendous. You know? For instance, um, you will have on, a, an, on one of these um, contact areas, you can have more than 10 tons of uh, load on a few square centimeters. Yes, okay, so it's a very big load. So this, the hardening is, is important. And, you, and nowadays it's being done in, in special uh, units, okay? And because of that, you, uh, you can also, the, the, the idea of uh, heat treating the, the rails to obtain better microstructures, hmm, potentially better than um, uh, fine perlite uh, are being explored. So for instance, this example here, hmm, this would be a traditional 
uh, railroad uh, steel, rail steel. It's a perlitic steel, so we have a lot of carbon, right, to make the perlite. All right. And uh, so we'll add some chromium to uh, Im improve the strength. And, and this is the, uh, the, uh, the transformation diagram here. So what we usually, the way we make this, uh, the microstructure, we cool down, yes? And then we go through the bainite transformation, oh, sorry, the perlite transformation, okay? With the bainitic steels, the story is different. We don't need that much carbon, yes? And the bainitic steels we're, we are using have relatively high silica. Yes. Reason is we are trying to make a very fine carbide-free bainite, low carbon bainite. Yes. And um, here, of course, in order to, uh, to do this, um, of course, because I, I have so much less carbon, I don't really have to worry about perlite formation, but I do have to worry about very fast uh, ferrite formation. So in order to avoid that, I need to have uh, decent cooling in place, and I can do the bainite transformation, yes? The result is, uh, is shown here. Mm -hmm. Here I have uh, a perlitic steel, and here I have a carbide-free bainitic steel, and uh, in, in use for some time, yes, and you can see here that there is a tremendous difference in the wear between the two, yes, and so um, uh, benetic steels apparently, certainly these low carbon carbide free bainite uh, benetic steels have higher strength and appear to have a better fatigue resistance also. And in addition, because we have this very low carbon content uh, welding the steels, uh, the, the rails to one another is also uh, easier. Okay. So again, just a few images here of a, of a um, production uh, line here. Hmm. Uh, cooling beds of uh, modern uh, rail producing facilities are very always very impressive because you, you have uh, uh, in Europe and I think uh, in uh, in China you have now lines that will produce 120 meters of of, uh, of um, rail in the U.S. Um, maximum length up to now is. 90 feet, that's about 30 meters, yes? So that's considerably smaller, yes? And you get this distortion during the cooling, as I said. Um, as a consequence, uh, because you, the dimensions uh, of the rail are very important, you have very heavy straightening equipment in the, uh, in the finishing of, line, of uh, rail products. Huh? And so, uh, and you see this here, you have these rolls here, alternating rolls, yes, very rigid frame, and you basically bent the, uh, the, um, um, the rail back and forth till you've got the right uh, straight profile. Hmm? Um, and uh, yes, and you have to do it in two directions, huh? so, um, horizontal that's here and here vertical hmm? so that the, the, the rail is straight uh, in both horizontally and vertically. Testing is important. You want to see the material quality externally and internally. In order to make it to look into the material you have to do ultrasonic testing. Yeah, that uh, allows you to see if there are any internal defects. And uh, modern st uh, rail steel, sh uh, uh, you know, in, in um, uh, most advanced countries, is 100% of the production is tested, yes? For, um, yep. And here you see uh, uh, another s uh, straightener here, hmm? and you see here the rolls that 
will bend the, uh, the rail till it's perfectly straight. When you look at, um, at beams, yes, uh, basically in terms of the cross section, you know, it's, it's not very far from uh, what a, uh, a, a rail looks like. Yeah? So uh, obviously uh, there are very big similarities between uh, uh, rail mills and uh, beam mills and very often it's the same co company or plants that will be producing both, yes? Um, both of these long products. Mm -hmm. So uh, here you see a, um, a, a white flange, uh, so white flange meaning this here, right? Uh, is long, beam mill for uh, construction. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, so, uh, also here, the technology is towards universal rolling rather than uh, these gro using these grooved rolls, yes? Mm -hmm. And you typically go from a billet, yes, mm -hmm. through, the, you know, through a line that will end, uh, you know, after... Uh, about 10 deformation steps will give you a, um, a nice I-beam. Hmm? This is an example here of a um, uh, possible production uh, route here. Hmm? So you, uh, you start with these uh, grooved rolls, two high grooved rolls, yes. Okay, and then the horizontal roll here, this is a universal uh, uh, mill, uh, stand rather, with combined vertical and horizontal rolls, yes. And you can see here this is further reduced, yes. And then you take care of the, the finishing of these edges, yeah. Okay, so nowadays, yes. Uh, very often these steps in the past would be done back and forth in reversing uh, fashion. Nowadays, most of the modern technologies will be certainly for medium section mills, medium section uh, sizes here, right? Um, you will have universal stands, yes? Universal stands. Uh, uh, position such a way that you get continuous operation. So the uh, material comes in here, yes, and never goes back. It just goes uh, straight through all the uh, universal um, uh, mills, stands. This is an example here of a five stand uh, uh, mill for medium section uh, products. So you can see here, here you have the motors, Yes, these are the vertical parts. Um, I can't see, give you some education here. Uh, uh, yeah, here you see there are motors in between. Yes, there's another motor here, yes. That takes care of the horizontal parts, the horizontal uh, um, um, rolls of the, uh, of the mill. Hmm? Okay, so let's have a look at um, this particular uh, line or, or something similar. So how does the, um, how do you work? Yeah, well this, um, so you start with the reheating furnace. Your, uh, in this particular case, uh, beam blanks are used. Yes, so you have already pre-shaped uh, materials coming out of the um, reheating furnace. Again, temperatures. Uh, 1100 to 1200 degrees C, yeah? Um, and you do uh, roughing, in this case five stands, yes? Um, so that's here, yes? You shear the, um, uh, the end, so the, um, uh, your product has the right length, yes? And here you start you can see here the finishing line, the different stands, two, the, the, the two first stands of the 10-stand finishing line. Yeah? 
So after the, uh, this material has uh, you finished the, the rolling and you're cooling, you've cooled it, you do the straightening of the, the product, just like you did for rails, yes? You straighten the products, yes? Horizontally and vertically. And then you do a final cutting to length, yes? According to the, uh, what's been, um, uh, what the customer needs. And then uh, stack these products and ship them. Okay, so very important in, uh, the uh, technology nowadays is the way you shape the, the beams is the new technology is almost entirely universal technology. So horizontal and vertical rolling at the same time. Um, then uh, the, uh, the product quality is improved by ensuring that the microstructure is homogeneous. Now, if you look at a beam, yes, when it's, when you're going to cool it, yes, um, it's not going to be, it's not going to cool at the same rate everywhere, yes. Uh, for instance, you can very well imagine that if you leave it to cool in air, um, these ends here, yes, will cool much faster, and, and here the middle section here, will cool much faster than these, these areas here. Yes? So in order to address this uh, inhomogeneity in microstructure that will result from it, you avoid hot spots. Yeah? And that's where the flange, the flange and the web uh, meet. Yes, you get these hot spots here, and so you cool them. You, you, you actually water cool them, yes, uh, when they uh, come out of the, um, the mill. Hmm? So you can see here that this, this is water cooled because it's dark, yes? So it's cooler than, than this part, yeah? And that's because there is a, a cooling nozzle here installed to make sure that uh, this doesn't develop into hot spots, okay? For um, uh, large beams, yes, there is a, um, a technology that's used, it's very similar to what uh, we discussed for rebar uh, when, we, um, when we closed the lecture on, uh, at the close of the lecture uh, on Tuesday, is you have a technology that's called QST, yes, QST. And um, these um, I-beams are uh, high-quality I-beams where you control the microstructure uh, via this technique called QSD, which stands for quench and self-temper. Yeah? So what, what you do here is after the... Uh, the um, deformation, the, the manufacturing of your of your roll uh, of your uh, beams, excuse me. You cool the uh, outer side of your uh, I beam very heavily, yes. So it develops a very fine microstructure and very high strength on the outer part of the beam, yes. And then you basically leave it, yes, to temper this very hard outer uh, part, yes, by core reheating. So that means the, 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 surf, the, the surface gets cooled and the, the bulk, of course, cools much uh, less quickly. And you get a tempering of this very hard outer um, um, uh, layer of the uh, the beam. That's technology that's used for really heavy beams that where you require very high strength. So um, what are we talking about? Like beams that are are, are uh, used for uh, very high uh, rise construction, and that, because that gives you a um, again a material that's very 
because of the, um, the very high strength on the outer side and the interior a much more um, a, a tougher and ductile material get very nice uh, properties. Hmm? Right, so these constructional steels are you know, very widely used. There's not a building that doesn't use them, yes? Um, buildings, bridges, parking, offshore, you name it. Um, how is the trend, yes? You would think that um, for these type of products, uh, with the kind of uh, uh, chemistries we use for steel, etc., and the, the, there would not be much development. Yes. Well, actually, that's not the case. There's a lot of development to try to make also here higher strength materials. Why is that interesting? Also for building, well, it's because when you, when you have a building, you have to build it, yes? And so it's much uh, more economical to work with lighter materials, right? So if you use uh, lighter um, uh, beams, yes, you, your transport costs may go down, your uh, construction costs can go down, etc. So there is, that's one of the drivers uh, behind the use of um, more advanced and higher strength steels. Hmm? So, um, so, so what's the trend? Uh, typical standard uh, steels were 355 yield strengths, yes. Nowadays, we apply thermomechanical rolling, yes. Accelerated cooling. QST for the, uh, uh, the beams with uh, slightly uh, uh, heavier sections. And what you see is that nowadays uh, yield strengths of close to 500 megapascals are actually um, quite, um, uh, are, are becoming of interest and, and available for constructions. Hmm? Otherwise, in terms of, this is an example here of a, um, uh, about 500 megapascal yield strength that's, um, that's being used. Yeah? Um, and you can see um, elongations a maximum up to uh, 22%. Um, this is a, uh, so, so if, if I, I would go back here, uh, this, is, this would be this, this type of steel, right? Okay. And uh, also, it's, it's, it's not some laboratory thing, right? It's, it's act an actual um, uh, material that is used to, you know, flange, uh, uh, excuse me, an I-beam um, uh, material, right? So, um, and it's according to uh, uh, ESTM 913. So it's for high-strength, low-alloy structural steel produced by QST. So that's uh, um, a grade where th these properties are obtained by QSD. Um, let's have a look, perhaps, at the composition of these steels, because um, that's rather interesting. Low carbon, yes. Not much in terms of manganese and silicon. You always see with the silicon half a percent. You know, for the strength, but not too much, so that you don't um, you don't uh, have problems with toughness. Yeah? But you can see other elements, you know, copper, also strengthening. Yeah? Um, there's niobium, 500 ppm of niobium, so you know it's microalloyed. Yes, to get strength. Yes. Um, vanadium also microalloyed. Yes, and of course, the, the reason why um, these things are added is because your carbon content is so low, and so, and why would the carbon content be so low? Well, because um, in construct on construction sites, there may be need to do welding, yes, and 
um, on the welding things on the construction site, you want to have a, a, a material that doesn't give you any problems in terms of welding. So you need to have a, a very low uh, carbon equivalent. So that means low carbon, low manganese, yes, et cetera. So, so that's why uh, these uh, um, QST uh, materials are also very often um, also micro alloyed steels. All right. So again, um, just to, um, to wrap up this part, yes, structural beams and rails, very different, yes. With the rails, even though, you know, shape-wise, they are obviously related, and, and, and some um, companies will make both of them, although nowadays the trend is to, you know, if you make rails, you make rails, you know, and if you make beams, you make beams, you don't, you know. It's you know, because the rails are becoming really specialized products. Yep. Um, but the, the you know, very important um, aspect of uh, rail, uh, metallurgy, physical metallurgy, is the, the wear resistance. Yeah? And in particular, this contact rolling wear. And then um, shape rolling is a technology that uh, is, is really uh, uh, being introduced in... Um, for the manufacturing of um, beams and of um, uh, uh, rails, and then there is this general trend into uh, developing, uh, you know, newer microstructures. Hmm? Because the, the standard microstructure for both constructional steels was ferrite perlite, and in the case of the uh, the rails, it was basically, uh, and in much in many cases, still uh, fully perlitic. Okay, so I have a few minutes left, and I will um, play products here. Yeah. Um, introduce uh, the plate products, which I will then uh, continue next Tuesday. There we go. Um, the uh, lecture will will actually focus also on tubular products because there are uh, a lot of um, interesting developments uh, in the area of tube products and in particular uh, tubes, uh, large tubes that are being used for the transport of um, petroleum and gas, hmm? and usually call them API uh, tubes, it refers to the grades. So, I mean, there's a huge amount of tubular products, you know, um, plastic, um, you know, to steel, to um, lots of materials are being used to, to, uh, to make tubular products, yes? But when it comes to steel, uh, we uh, will um, classify them on the basis of their uh, diameter. Production technology is important. You know, they're, very, they're very different routes in the production of welded uh, tubes and seamless tubes. So a uh, just a, a seamless tube is seamless. There's no, there's no weld, yes? In the case of a welded tube, you have a weld, yes? And of course, uh, if you have a weld, you always have a problem or an issue, yes? So you can make seamless tubes. Uh, you can easily make seamless tubes. Uh, it's not a big... Uh, problem the the challenge is you the, the problem is you cannot make very big tubes that are seamless yes and if you want to make big tubes you have to use sheet products hot rolled sheet or um, plates and that's where uh, part of the lectures on uh, next week will be about 
Um, so we'll, we'll uh, review, uh, you know, how you make um, uh, tubes. You can use a slitted strip. Um, you can use, uh, you can produce spiral pipe, um, ERW pipe. ERW stands for uh, electric resistance welded pipe, seamless pipe, and tube, etc. And so we'll we'll talk about plate hmm, for the production of large diameter uh, uh, steel pipes, and that, because that's an interesting development. Uh, the reason being that the demands in certain areas for these large uh, diameter uh, steel pipes, in particular demands coming from the petroleum industry, uh, has led to a very uh, advanced use of thermomechanical controlled processing in the production of these steel plates. And, uh, and one of the things that's uh, very important for these steels is not only the fact that we need strength, but also toughness. Yes. Right, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how this is being done, how this is being achieved, and um, how successful uh, people have been. Hmm? So let's have a look at these uh, this tubular steel products. Hmm? So tubes can be uh, made with slitted strip, with plate, or billets. Yeah? So slitted strip is basically uh, spiral pipes and tubes, electric uh, resistance welded pipes and tubes, and, and then also uh, butt welded, not pie, but pipe and tubes. Plates, uh, we usually refer to the tubes that are made with uh, plate as uh, UO, pipe, um, the, the letters U and O refer to the fact that you, you start with a plate. This plate is then shaped into a U shape, yes, and then shaped into an O shape, uh, and then you make a weld here. So that's why, where the name comes from, UO uh, pipe. And then um, seamless pipes and uh, tubes uh, sorry, seamless pipes and tubes are made with billets, yes, round billets uh, um, that, um, and uh, where you do a piercing, a piercing uh, process to make uh, seamless uh, pipes. Uh, so we, we can classify them on the basis of, you know, how we make them. We, oops, yeah, we can also classify them on the basis of their applications. Yes? Okay, that's important. Um, because depending on the application, uh, the requirements may be uh, easy to achieve or very difficult to achieve. Yeah. So, um, so we have general applications. We use standard uh, line pipes. Then you have for... Um, the, the tubes that are used for the oil and gas industry. They're very specific, yes? And they go by the name OCTG, OCTG uh, goods. Yeah? It's oil country tubular goods, yes? All country. And so they're being used to make well casings, so, you know, during exploration, yeah? Um, lining the surface uh, of drilled wells for tubing and tubing within the weld, excuse me, the well for the extraction of uh, oil and gas, and of course also drill pipes to make the wells. Hmm? Pipes are used in heat exchangers, yes, so we, we call them uh, boiler pipes, yes, and, for, and we, we find them, of course, in uh, power generating facilities. And then we also have mechanical pipes, yes? Yeah, for mechanical applications, structural applications. Yeah? And more and more, 
nowadays, pipes are used to build as building materials. I don't know if you've uh, looked at uh, modern buildings. Um, the entry uh, part of GIFT, for instance, is built entirely with tubes. Yes. So there is also a trend. Uh, if you visit Incheon, uh, you will also see uh, lots of the structural parts are actually tubes, not beams, but tubes. So um, these tubular products, when, when you have a tube, right? Uh, if I don't tell you what this is, it can be extremely small tube, it can be a huge tube, right? So obviously uh, the radius or the diameter is important hmm? and the thickness is important, right? And so if we look at uh, the types of uh, pipes, yes? Um, and uh, the sizes, well, um, seamless pipe, we tend to have small diameters and medium diameters. So what, what, does, you know, what does that mean? Well, um, small will be uh, 25 millimeters, yes, diameter, to uh, about 100. So you probably wonder why, why, are these, why, you, why you have these crazy numbers here. That's because um, the numbers come from um, inches, inches, right? Tubular products. And so I uh, changed, put them into millimeters. Uh, so anyway, so up to 400 uh, millimeters. Hmm? So thicknesses, two millimeters up to uh, 60 millimeters. And lengths, yes, about 20 meters. Yeah, so that's a typical maximum length, about 20 me meters that you can get in terms of products. Okay, I see it's uh, 12, uh, 15 past uh, 12. Let's start.